Here's a question that is going to be a little uncomfortable for some of us, but interesting and even helpful for others of us. When it comes to knowing if there is a God, and if so, who is this God that we are dealing with? What is God like? Does it really come down to religion to answer our questions? I mean, wasn't religion something that was made up by ancient people who were trying to make sense of all of the unknowns about the world that we live in? Wasn't it their way of trying to bridge the gap from what they understood to what they didn't understand about our world and how it works? I mean, wasn't it just their answer to the question of why is my child sick in an age before they understood things like bacterial infections or viruses? Wasn't it just a, try, a way to try to influence things that they couldn't control, like if they could appease the gods, then maybe the gods would send some rain? Are we, as modern people, really supposed to use ancient religious texts to shape our worldviews, and our beliefs, texts that were written in an era before things like biology or chemistry or astronomy or meteorology or physics? Does it really come down to religion to answer our questions about God? Well, as long as I've gone this far, isn't the whole purpose of religion create fertile ground for superstition? I mean, if the purpose is to bridge the gap between what we know and what we don't know, isn't that where superstition rises up to fill the gap? I mean, superstition is when you do something to get an outcome, but you couldn't quite explain to somebody how exactly that works. And we all know that religion is fertile ground for abusive people. You see, every once in a while, someone comes along and they claim to be from God or they claim to represent God, therefore their authority is unquestionable. Or someone comes along who claims to hear from God so they alone have the secret knowledge of how to fill in the blank between what we know and what we don't know about our world. Now, I say all of this because at an event like Easter in Lake Country, I know we have all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds who are here for all kinds of different reasons. For some of us, for you, Easter means the resurrection of Jesus from the grave, and you are here to celebrate resurrected life. For others of us, you grew up going to church, and Easter just doesn't feel like Easter without the Easter service. For others of us in the room, you wouldn't consider yourself a religious person, but you're not an atheist either. You're not really sure what you are. You're, you're something in between. But you'd be honest enough to say that religion hasn't always given satisfactory answers to your doubts or hang-ups when it comes to knowing God. And for some of us, uh, you are not a religious person. And you're here because of family members. Don't look at them right now. <laughs> but you've just learned, you know what, it's easier to just go to the Easter service than it is to have the discussion with them and try and explain one more time why I'm not religious anymore. For some of us, maybe you are currently drifting away from a religious practice. For others of us, you left all of that in the rearview mirror a long time ago. If that's you, you're not alone. Just this week, the Gallup organization released a poll showing that record numbers of Americans are leaving religious practice, all religious practice, behind. Now, that happens because many people tell themselves a subtraction story. A subtraction story goes like this. I simply subtracted from my worldview everything supernatural or superstitious and what I was left with was rational secularism, accepting the world as it actually is. The problem with the subtraction narrative is that it overlooks the fact that, like religious belief, secularism also requires a leap of faith. Let me give you an example. 
why is there a universe? Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there a Milky Way galaxy for us to live in? Why are there 500 billion galaxies in the universe? All religious traditions say that there is something rather than nothing because of a supernatural cause. A supernatural cause created our universe. But secular people say our universe had no cause. It just is. Now, logically, we know that both of these cannot be true. Either our universe was caused or our universe was not caused. Which one can you prove with a laboratory test? Which one can you demonstrate scientifically? The answer, of course, is neither. So if you're a secular person, ultimately, at some point, ironically, you have to take a leap of faith to defend your worldview that there is no God. So does that mean we're all stuck? We're all stuck trying to figure out what we, we believe and what our worldview is without being able to ultimately prove it at its base. We are if we keep asking the wrong question. You see, both religious belief and secularism grow out of the same question. And the question we're trying to answer is, what do you believe? What do you believe about the afterlife? What do you believe about the meaning or purpose of life? What do you believe about God? What do you believe about the origins of the universe? Because we're reaching into things that we don't fully know or understand. We're reaching into things that we cannot scientifically demonstrate. And so the answer to all of these questions, whether you're religious or secular, is I believe that or I believe in. I believe in the Christian God. I believe in the Muslim God. I believe that there is no God. But it's always I believe. And we're going to be stuck there at odds until we realize we're trying to answer the wrong question. There's a better question, a different question if we want to bridge the divide between what we understand and what we don't understand. And the question is not, what do you believe? See, the problem with that question is it causes you to look inward. And if you want to find the meaning of life, if you want to find out if there is an afterlife, if you want to learn about God, you can't look within. You're just going to find more of yourself if you look within. We need to ask a different question that helps us see all of this from a different paradigm. And the question I'm going to introduce you to today has everything to do with Easter. In the first century in the Roman Empire, after the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth, a loyal group of followers, about 500 people, remained his followers after he died. And what's curious is this group of 500 people grew to a number of thousands of people and then tens of thousands of people, and eventually hundreds of thousands of people. In spite of the fact that this was a persecuted illegal religion in the Roman Empire. Now, one of the people who was against Christianity was a first century Jewish Pharisee named Paul. Uh, as a Jewish Pharisee, it was his team, his tribe that was responsible for having Jesus executed. And if you have ever thought to yourself that Christians are annoying, not me, the other ones. If you've ever thought to yourself that Christians are annoying, you would have loved Paul. Except he just didn't find them annoying. He found them to be a problem. You see, Paul knew the answer to the question, what do I believe? He believed that the Jesus movement was opposed to the will of God. He believed that Christians were a nuisance to be eradicated, and that's how he began his career, hunting down Christians, arresting Christians, overseeing their trials, overseeing their executions. And he continued that way until something happened that caused him to ask a different question, a better question, and see the whole thing through a different paradigm. And when that happened, he became a follower of Jesus after Jesus had been crucified. And he flipped. He began to spend the rest of his life becoming the biggest brand ambassador for Christianity in the entire first century. He began traveling from city to city within the Roman Empire. And everywhere he went, he told people, you too, like me, should become followers of Jesus. 
Who's that? He was a rabbi. Where? In Palestine. Where is he today? He was executed by the government. Kind of a tough sell. But that's what he did. And the reason why he was successful at it was not because he challenged what people believed. He introduced them to the better question that we're going to learn about today. Uh, to do that, we're going to read an episode from his life that happened in the ancient city of Athens, Greece, and it took place in the year 49 AD. So this is only 16 years after Easter Sunday took place, 16 years. So uh, in our context, that would be like me standing on stage today and say, let me tell you about 2008. Uh, most of us have a living memory of 2008. Uh, let me jog your memory. There were really three major events that shaped global history that year. The first was the Great Recession triggered by the global financial crisis. Uh, the second event was that Barack Obama was elected president of the United States. The third major event was that Kung Fu Panda 1 was released in the theaters, starting one of the greatest movie franchises ever. Don't tell me about 4. I have not seen it yet. No spoiler alerts. Personally, 2008 was the year that I accepted the position to become Hope's lead pastor, all of which to say what we're going to read Paul talk about today was not a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Because when we think of religion, when we think of faith, when we think of Jesus, that's how our minds think of it. Paul is talking to them about some current events in their lifetime that they lived through. So Paul was on this journey, stopping, going from city to city to city, and he had, some, he had some buddies traveling with him, helping him out. And they remained behind in the previous city he visited. They had some things to clean up. So he goes to the city of Athens all by himself. He's there solo. So he's got a couple of days to tour the city, to play tourist, uh, to pick up some souvenirs, to check out Athenian cuisine and culture, find the good restaurants. And uh, we're going to pick it up uh, right there in Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them, his, his buddies, while he was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Now, you probably already know that ancient Greek theology was a polyistic theology filled with all kinds of gods and goddesses. Basically, anytime there was a blank to fill in between what they understood about the world and what they didn't understand, they would just drop in a different god or different goddess. So Zeus was the sky god. He controlled the lightning and the thunder, right? We had Poseidon, who was the god of the oceans and the seas. We have Hades, who was the god of the underworld. Uh, we had Helios, who controlled the movement of the sun. So in their ancient world, now why does the sun rise in the east and set in the west? Uh, Helios is the reason why. He controls the sun. They also had a deities when it came to abstractions and ideas. For example, Aphrodite was the goddess of love. Why do young men fall in love like they do? Oh, it's Aphrodite. That's the reason why. So he notices as he tours the city of Athens that this is a city that is consumed with the question, what do you believe? Everyone in Athens is asking the question, what do you believe. And in their ancient world where there are a lot of blanks to fill in between what they understood and didn't, there are all kinds of gods and goddesses that they believed in to fill in those blanks. Paul is distressed to see this reality because he knew that was not the right question to ask. So in verse 17, this is what he did about it. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Now, Epicureans and Stoics, they were on the opposite ends of the philosophical spectrum. Epicureans were the ones who said, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Hey, life is complicated. It's hard. Let's not think about that. Let's have another glass of Chardonnay. So, so this is like your sister-in-law. You know, this is the person who just, woo! whatever. Um, hashtag YOLO, hashtag FOMO, hashtag party like it's 1999. Those were the Epicureans. The Stoics were the opposite. They were the thinkers. They were the ones who said life is pain. Life is suffering. Detach from your emotions. Deal with things reasonably. And if we think about it long enough using our rational minds, we will figure it out. So these two are always at each other, arguing their different philosophies. And Paul shows up with something entirely different. Verse 18, some of them asked, 
what is this babbler trying to say? Which was my first five years of preaching, by the way. You've got some people to thank for taking that one for the team. Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about what? Jesus and the resurrection, not Jesus and his ideas, not Jesus and his teachings, not Jesus and his philosophies. That's what they assumed someone would come to Athens and talk about. Oh, you've got a new idea. You've got a new teaching. You've got a new religion. What? Zeus isn't the main god. There's also Hey, Zeus, who are you talking about? What is this? So Paul, Paul says, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about a new belief or a new idea or a new philosophy. Let's talk about current events. He changes the category on them. I want to talk about a man who lived in our generation named Jesus who did something in Palestine. Something happened 16 years ago. A man died, and he came back to life. Now, this was intriguing enough to them that they invite Paul to the main stage. Verse 19, then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. Now, the Areopagus was a hill in the city of Athens that you can go and visit today, and it was a place where teachers and philosophers, the city council would hang out there, but the teachers and philosophers would hang out there all day. They would drink espressos, and they would argue and talk about ideas and philosophies, kind of like you did for about one semester in college, and then it got old, and you found something more fun to do. Um, but they said, Paul, come here and tell us more about what it is that you believe. We want to understand what you're bringing to us. Verse 22. And then Paul stood up in a meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So, you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Now, 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 this is so interesting. In this ancient city with all these temples, with all these idols, they had a lot of answers. They had a lot of answers to what are the gods like or what happens when you die. They had a lot of blanks to fill in. They had a lot of answers to fill in, but they did not have a lot of certainty about those answers, did they? So they set up an altar, and they dedicated this altar to the unknown God. Now, this is kind of the insurance policy religion. Um, this is the just in case, just, just in case, J just in case this God we overlooked in, as we are filling in the blanks, just in case this God we overlooked ever shows up and he's upset with us, we can say, oh, no, uh, we've been worshiping you all along. Hey, look, here's your altar. We just didn't know your name yet. Now, we hear about that and we say, how superstitious. This is why religion is a problem. They're just guessing at the answers. And it just sounds naive and superstitious to us, but I'm telling you, as a pastor, I see people do this all the time. Well, we're not really religious, but we got our kids baptized, just in case. Well, I'm not really religious, but, but every once in a while, I'll kind of throw a prayer up in the air, just in case. You see, whenever your life is driven by beliefs where you're trying to fill in the gap between what is known and what we just don't know, it might bring some answers, but religion does not bring a lot of certainty. Paul puts his finger on the weakness of all religion, every religion, and says, here's what you are uncertain about. Let's talk about that. And he does. Verse 24, the God who made the world. And everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, 
and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives life and breath to everyone. So, so he totally disses their entire belief system. He says, you have a God for the sun. You have a God for the earthquakes. You have a God for the oceans. There is one God who rules heaven and earth. And you see that temple over there? God's too big to fit in there. And you see that temple over there? It's too small for God. And not only that, God doesn't need anything from you. I see how you leave your offerings for the gods at their temples. I see how you leave your food and your money at the altars for your gods. God doesn't need your stuff. Religion does, but God does not. God doesn't need something from you as if he lacked anything. God is the provider. God is the giver. He is the one who provides all things for all people. Verse 26, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him. And perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Say, so guys, there is something you know deep down in your bones. And what you know deep down in your bones is that God is near. He is close. And he has arranged when and where people live so that they would try to reach out to find him because he is near, because he is close. And that perhaps we would find him because you know it in your bones. You know it that you were made to live in the presence of this God. We were made in the image of this God. That's why he doesn't quote his religious text. He quotes their own poets. He quotes a Greek poet from the third century BC, Erotus, and says, in him we live and move and have our being. And he quotes Epimenides from the 6th century B.C. who said, we are his offspring. You know that you were made for union with God. And if that's true, he says in verse 29, therefore, since we are God's offering, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. Pause. I, I just toured your whole city. There are idols everywhere. They're made of gold. They're made of silver. They're made of stone. They're made of wood. You have temples for them to house them. Listen, if we are made in God's image, why would we think that God is of lesser value than we are as human beings? See, you're so caught up in the question of what we believe, you're missing the big picture, guys. And he's appealing to what they intuitively know about God. And he says this, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. He says, you just didn't know. God overlooked your ignorance. But now, but now because something has happened in our generation, but now he commands all people, religious and irreligious, everywhere to repent. Now, Paul's in Athens, he's speaking to Greek people, he's speaking in their Greek language. Greek was the English language of their generation, it was the main language that this was written down in the Greek language. The word for repent, if we translate that from Greek into English, very literally, it means this. Repent means to have a change of mind. To have a change of mind, to change your thinking about how you approach God. Paul says, I see how uncertain religion is leaving to you, is leaving you. What if we had a change of mind? What if we stopped asking that question, what do you believe, and have a change of mind about God? Because right in the middle of history, God has done something. God has done something to fill in the blank between what we know and what we don't know. And what he did is he sent the man, Jesus, his son, into this world. And Jesus was the perfect human. He lived a life perfectly for the glory of God the Father. And he showed us what it looks like to live in perfect union with God. 
But then on the cross, when he died, he died the death you deserve to die, bearing your sin, bearing the consequences for the sins that you have committed. He says to repent is to have a change in thinking, a change of mind about how you view the very way you approach God that has to do with Jesus. He continues, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. Pause. This God, who is the God of the heavens and the earth, has set a day when you will stand before him for judgment. You will, everybody you know will, everybody you met will, everyone who lived will stand before this God for judgment. And here's what it means to have a change of mind. Either as you stand before God, it will be based entirely on the life you have lived, the good and the bad. Whether you were religious or irreligious, everything on your record will stand before God for judgment. Or, he says, you can repent, have a change of mind about Jesus and say, God, I want you to judge me on the basis of the life that Jesus lived on my behalf. See, religion looks inward. Religion says, behave better, try harder, do more. Repentance says, I'm having a change of mind about that too. See, it's about putting your trust in the one who lived for me, to which at that point, the Athenians can say, Paul, that's just one more religion. That's just one more belief. That's just one more idea. Paul says, it's not, and here's the reason why. He has given proof of this to everyone. He's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. God has done something in the middle of history to give us certainty, or, or to the Athenians, he's done something in our generation so that we would know that a change of thinking about how we approach God is now necessary. And here's what the change of thinking is. It's time to throw out the question, what do you believe? Because that's not getting us any answers and replace it with a better question. The better question is what happened? What happened on Easter Sunday? What happened that gives us confidence about how to fill in the blank between what we know and what we don't know, between us and between God, between us and the afterlife? And Paul said the answer is to investigate to discover what happened in our generation, in our lifetime. It is investigable. Jesus did not come to bring a new philosophy or idea or belief or teaching. He came to be the way to God. Now, can you imagine Paul standing at the Areopagus talking to these Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, and he says, no, you guys are asking the wrong question. The right question is, what happened, okay? He just drops this brand new idea on them. As you would imagine, there were some very different responses. Verse 32, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. The first group sneered. And of course they sneered. Paul, we might have some uncertainties about our religious system, but here's what we do know. When a man dies, he generally stays dead. We don't have a lot of unknown around that. So they sneered. They, they thought that was foolishness, but Paul thought that was a win. And do you know why? Because now they're thinking about the right question. What happened? Now they're engaging with the right conversation. Now they're not arguing about what do you believe and what do you believe and how were you raised. Now they're talking about what happened in our generation. Now, I know that for some of us who are here on Easter Sunday, this is your reaction as well. And, and, and just so you know, um, at Hope Church, we're, we're genuinely okay with that. We are. You, you, don't, you don't have to believe to belong here. You can still be here, and, and we're fine with that. 
But if you don't become a Christian, it's not intellectually honest if you say, it's because I don't want to follow the way of Jesus or I don't like the teachings of Jesus. There's only one intellectually honest way that you can say, Jesus isn't for me. And it is to say, I believe that when Matthew wrote his biography of the life of Jesus, and he told us about how he saw Jesus raised on Easter Sunday, I think he was lying. And I think when Mark wrote his biography of the life of Jesus, what he said happened on Easter Sunday, and what he witnessed, he was lying, and Luke was lying, and John was lying. In fact, not just the people who wrote the biographies, but everyone who wrote in the first century who said they saw Jesus alive on Easter Sunday. I think James was lying. I think Peter was lying. I think the whole lot of them were lying. Now, you can say that. But now we're having the right conversation. In fact, Paul himself, he was the first in line to say, if Christ had not been raised on Easter Sunday, everything I teach is worthless. And if you're a Christian, your faith is too. Because if Jesus did not come back to life on Easter Sunday, Christianity is just another idea. It's just another religion. It's just another ancient idea trying to fill in the blank between what we know and what we don't know about God and the afterlife, the meaning of life, and all of those things. So if you're going to reject Christianity, do it for the right reason. Because if he did rise from death, then who cares what he taught? This is the Son of God. For others of us, we fall in the second group. The second group said, Paul, we would like to hear you again on this matter. This, this is brand new for us. You're telling us something happened in history. Um, we're not gullible. We're not just going to believe something because you said it. We're going to need to wrestle with this. And Paul's like, cool. When should I come back? Let's talk about this some more. In fact, we can hop on a boat. We can go over to Jerusalem. I can introduce you to some people. You can interview them on your own. I can take you to the landmarks. I can show you what happened in our generation. And that's where some of us land when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to faith in Him, when it comes to Christianity. But we're busy people. We, we haven't had time to look into this. We're, we're trying to raise kids and work a job and put food on the table and pay the rent and take the dog out and all the things that go along with just being an adult these days. I get it. And if that's you, I'm inviting you to take one step. See, something that's really important for me as a pastor is that this is a church where people who don't believe can come in and have a respectful dialogue about faith, a place where you can come in and, and ask critical questions and express your doubts, and, and it's a safe place to do that. In fact, it's expected a place to come in and think critically about the things that Paul claimed. What did happen on Easter Sunday? What do the historians say about it? How did this tiny movement become the largest world religion even though it was persecuted for the first three centuries of its existence in the Roman Empire? Why don't you come and learn, think, lean into this? Say, I'm not believing it yet, but I want to learn more. If that's you, I'm inviting you to come to Starting Point. That's the environment. It starts in eight days on Monday, April the 8th, right here at the church. We're going to meet for seven weeks. And the only thing you need to bring is a curious mind and doubts. This is for people, whether you're a church person or not, to come and say, where is the actual starting point of faith for thinking adults? And finally, for others of us, this is your hope. Your hope is not anchored into what you believe. It is anchored into what happened on Easter Sunday that Jesus rose from death. And listen, for you, here's what I want you to know. In a world that is still filled with uncertainties, in a world where we are moved back and forth by our own emotions or changing beliefs, the resurrection of Jesus stands as a testimony of divine truth, a beacon of hope that God loves you. And there is more to life than this life. There is resurrected life, eternal life with God, the very thing we were made to live for. Jesus gives to anyone 
who has a change of mind and says, it's not about me anymore. It's about what he has done for me, and he rose on Easter Sunday proving he has the authority to do this. So I hope you'll take your next step. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you decided that the path to you is not filled in with our beliefs, but about what you did right in the middle of history, that you sent your son, Jesus, into our world. Jesus, thank you for the life you lived for us, for the death you died for us, and for demonstrating your authority, your power, your victory on Easter Sunday. Spirit, I ask that everyone here will have the honesty, the humility, and the courage to look into this event a little more because Easter is the event that changed everything in our world and it changed everything for our futures. So today, Jesus, we celebrate, we thank, we rejoice in, and we worship you. We pray all this in your name.